Hi there. My name is Lizette Coley. I'm the president of Parapsychology Foundation. I just wanted to pop in before you see this very fine interview with Dr. John Palmer. I wanted to thank John for this interview that he's done in recognition of our 65th anniversary. I also wanted to thank him for all his stalwart work for both Parapsychology and Parapsychology Foundation as he's been a contributor to our publications, conference participant, and above all, my late mother, our past president, Eileen Coley, and I have always been so proud to refer to him as the Eileen J. Garrett Professor of Parapsychology when he was so working in Irvine, California. I also want to congratulate John on all his years of being a very fine editor for the Journal of Parapsychology. And uh, really, he has so much more still to give, as hopefully the Foundation does too. But he's touched so many students and so many researchers in his path that uh, we all owe him a debt of gratitude. So on with the interview. Well, I was in high school, and uh, I uh, stumbled across a book in our high school library, and how it ended up there, I have no idea. It was a book called uh, Treatise of Parapsychology by uh, a French, I used to call psychological researcher named René Soudre, and uh, he, uh, there are really two parts to the book. Uh, the first part dealt primarily with uh, physical mediumship cases in the um, in the 19th century, particularly in the continent of Europe, and there are pictures of ectoplasm and all other kinds of, uh, of uh, good stuff. And then the uh, second uh, part of the book was about the card guessing studies of the day, uh, mainly the Rhine research and the soul research. Of course, what attracted me at the time was the physical mediumship stuff. I mean, as a high school student, that's that's quite quite impressive. And uh, so, you know, I was just really blown away by. It. I've always had sort of an interest in the philosophy of mind, even even at that early stage. And you know, one thing in the press view: why aren't other scientists taking this seriously? You know, they got very important fundamental kind of stuff. And that actually proved to be the theme of my valedictory address that I gave when I when I graduated. But then I started uh, looking into getting into parapsychology, and uh, uh, I I went for other reasons. I went to Duke as an undergraduate, and uh, of course that's where the parapsychology lab. This was in the mid nineteen sixties about when it was transferring from, uh, from Duke, where Ryan had retired from Duke, over to the Foundation for the Research of the Nature of Man, which is in a building right, right across the, the street from Duke C's campus. So I was around kind of during the, uh, the transition for that, and I spent one summer there. I think the first summer that I, I spent there was when they were still in the old East Duke building on the Duke campus. And then the second one was, uh, they were in the other building. And uh, this at the time when there were a bunch of other young, young parapsychologists at Ryan's laboratory who went on to be very famous in the field, notably Rick Stanford, Chuck Honerton, Bob Morris, Jim Carpenter. And uh, then we all kind of left in a huff at the end of that, and I just uh, basically contributed to that by sending a letter uh, saying from from Texas, because this was this was when, right when I went to 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 grad school, that I wouldn't be back for the for the for the next uh, for the for the subsequent summer. And uh, but I got my degree from. University of Texas, 1969, in personality psychology. I had overlapped the first uh, year there with Rex Stanford, who was also getting his, his PhD, but he was about two years ahead of me. But then I got my first job at McGill in, it was a teaching position, and uh, uh, I uh, 
that didn't work out uh, largely because I, I really didn't like teaching, particularly since you were teaching people who didn't want to really be there, like they were taking your course because they had to and they were talking in the back of the room and everything. And I just, I just did not like teaching at all. So I was looking for a research position. And, uh, and of course, one place where you, where you can get research positions, even, even actually, ironically, more easier to get research positions, straight research and in parapsychology that wasn't in psychology. After I decided to leave uh, McGill, I had actually contacted my friend uh, Rex Stanford, who at the time was was also who was working at the University of Virginia, and uh, we got talking. And I decided to uh, see if I could get a, a research position in, in Ian Stevenson's laboratory, and we did some negotiating, and and, and that worked out. And uh, it was around 1973 that, or somewhere thereabouts, that, uh, or 72 or 73, that I, that I started there. That was my first, uh, that was really my first uh, job in, in, in parapsychology. And of course that lab was dedicated to survival research. And I, I, was, I wasn't mainly interested in that, it was, but I was able to do some research on out-of-the-body experiences which is at least kind of around the fringes. And also Gaither Pratt was there and he wasn't doing uh, survival research either, but of course he was a very famous person in the field. So same rule didn't quite apply to him as applied to, to others. And he was interested in, at least I worked with him almost any poltergeist cases. We went out and investigated a couple, I investigated a couple of poltergeist cases with him. And of course also that's when I did my, uh, random uh, mail survey, psychic experiences, with uh, uh, the sample coming from being a combination of the uh, well, two subsamples, one being sort of townspeople in the city of Charlottesville, Virginia, and the other one being students at the University of Virginia. And we just asked them a number of, actually quite, it was a fairly extensive questionnaire. And of course I would, you know, cross-tabulated all the results and, and, and got a fairly extensive paper out of it. So then after that, we uh, uh, sort of ran out of money, and uh, this is where the, where the Parapsychology Foundation came in and uh, rescued me. They, they had funded the, uh, the Virginia survey, because I still needed outside money, uh, even though I was you know, working at Stevenson's lab. In 1977 is uh, when uh, the Parapsychology Foundation funded a, a graduate program in a, a master's level in consciousness studies at uh, an adult education university in, in Orinda, California called John F. Kennedy University. And uh, it was set up by a guy, named, a very fascinating guy named Pascal Kaplan, who uh, actually uh, shared my interest in a sort of an Indian uh, uh, guru, I guess you'd call him, Mayor Baba, claimed, claimed, claimed to be an avatar, both had an interest in him. And I'd, I'd actually visited their center in South Carolina when I was, uh, when I was uh, even before I, I got there. So we had kind of a common bond there, and uh, it had three subdivisions. One was mysticism, and that was the section that Kaplan had. Then there was parapsychology, which is the section that I headed. And then there was transpersonal program. And of course, we were an enclave, and the, the transpersonal one was the one that had the tremendous amount of students, and they really paid the bills apart from because we, we depended on the parapsychology foundation sex C money I and mean, there was no way that the that you know we generate enough students to uh, to uh, you know pay for it without their assistance and uh, and it was really I, I think it was uh, you know probably the three or four years of the last it was about the, the best time of my life I had a great time we, we had we had a tremendous group very de dedicated group of students that came in and some of them who went on 
in parapsychology for at least a period of time. And the one that's been stayed in parapsychology the longest is, is Carlos Alvarado, mm -hmm. who is still very, very active in the field. And, uh, and then a few others, Patrick Geisler is interested in anth anthropology, and then he, he has stayed in the field for several years after that and published uh, several papers about some work he had done with uh, the uh, shamans in, in, uh, in the Afro-Brazilian cults, I guess you'd call them, uh, shamans and research he had done with them. And... Uh, then there was uh, another one of my students named Carol Irwin published, I think, one of the most, most important methodological papers in parapsychology. In, uh, uh, and uh, which unfortunately isn't cited nearly as much as it should be, but uh, I thought that was a very important development. So, so the field benefited from this program, and it was just, uh, you know, the energy level was just fantastic, and it was just really a wonderful experience and just a couple of years ago uh, when they had the Parapsychological Association Convention in Sonoma, California they uh, they had a little retrospective for um, the JFK program and uh, a number of my former students attended and, and they had a party afterwards everybody was you know saying how much they enjoyed the program and everything and I really realized I had a you know, I really had a very positive impact on a lot of these people's lives, even though they they didn't go on in parapsychology. So that really made me made me feel good. It made me feel what the another reason beyond just the, the parapsychological implications. Uh, you know, it was worthwhile at a number of levels. One thing I remember, a lot of times I would. Occasionally go up and visit there. I was on. I know I was on the board of the ASPR for a while, and uh, that brought me to New York fairly frequently. But there, there are a number of times I went. I, I went there, and even if it wasn't any real great business, you know, they take me out to lunch, and it was just just really wonderful people to to interact with. I remember, uh, of course, uh, uh, Babs Coley was. Uh, I think it was Eileen Garrett's daughter, that she was, uh, she was very active at the time. You know, it was in the early 70s where I became familiar with them. And, uh, uh, you know, they were just wonderful people to interact with. And then Lizette, her daughter, who was now really, really taking over the operation. And their sort of the manager, Alan Engolf, was a very nice guy. I remember him as well. And I just remember just having enjoyable interactions with them at anything on a personal level, of course, in addition to, you know, getting the, getting the financial support. I don't think I was in a time when they originally would have them overseas at really very glamorous locations. And I, I miss those, but they, the, ones I, the ones I was attended were uh, in the U.S., but still, you know, you were... You were taken care of and wined and dined and everything, and and uh, the the conferences themselves were great. You would have a lot of very very prominent people uh, on uh, on you know there was a, a topic or a theme for each conference, and they would bring in. Uh, I think particularly in the in, in the early overseas one, they were bringing a lot of people outside of parapsychology. I think uh, in the ones I was in, there were probably more more parapsychologists, but uh, you know, the, you know, they, they would have themes, and then uh, everybody would present a paper, and uh, then afterwards there were discussions among the the uh, people who were presenting papers, which kind of formed like a panel, and then everybody would comment on the other person's papers, and that. And that discussion, along with the paper itself, was published in, in the proceedings, which they, they put out in, in a hardback book form. And, uh, you know, they were just very intellectually stimulating and, uh, and valuable, valuable conferences. There were, there were three of their conferences that I presented papers at. The first one was 1984 in New Orleans. And I presented a the paper I presented there was commonalities in the in the criticisms of parapsychology, and that was actually a springboard into my reconceptualization papers. There was sort of the the grounding of that of those. 
The second one, 1988, I have done a paper on the experimenter effect, which has become uh, a major interest of mine recently. And uh, I did publish a paper that not not in not in a, a PF publication, but I did present a major paper several years later based on what I said in that conference. It took me about experimenter psi. And then the third paper was their conference in Boston in 1993 on the theme of which was thanatology. I wrote another important paper that I think I wrote, which I haven't gotten much uh, uh, much citation. Of course, it was it would be in the proceeding, which isn't going to get get cited particularly anyway. And but I generally present my own survival theory, which was kind of speculative, and I never really wanted to make too much of it. But uh, I thought it was kind of interesting. I even ended up presenting it at a couple of conferences here because I think it, it has some interesting ideas in it, and uh, it probably should get more more sway than it's had. But you know, I mean, I'm, I consider it kind of an important paper, but I'm, because it is speculative, I'm a little, you know, I don't, a little more, maybe not be immodest to make too much of it, but I think it, I think it has some interesting ideas, and I think it was, uh, I think it was something that people should pay attention to, if you can, you know, just not read into it more than is there. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of good debate back and forth, particularly in the thanatology one, because I was taking a position that was very different from what most of the people there were taking. And I, I even got a letter from, uh, I think Emily Kelly didn't like my survival theory because it really didn't talk about the survival of an intact personality. And it was more more like a William Roll kind of theory in that respect. But, you know, I think it got some good, good lively discussion going, and I think... It, you know, create some food for thought. When I was uh, working at Ryan's laboratory, because you know, we we uh, you know, part of my job there is to keep what's going on in the field, and of course, uh, Parapsychology Foundation have published uh, you know, the Parapsychology Review. They're they're they're. Uh, it's actually sort of a, sort of mid, midway between a, a, a journal and a magazine, uh, and I don't know how else to describe it. And of course, I was I was aware of their of their conferences, and uh, you know some of the, some of the material that that was published in those locations. And you know, I was was aware of something of the history of Eileen Garrett and 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 uh, and all that. And of course, subsequently, I of course I. Yeah, I became aware that they gave out research grants, and that's and that's, I think that's why I uh, you know I approached them for that because I realized they were actually one of the few sources available uh, for funding in the field at that time. Well, uh, I well I became you know there there was some correspondence and. Uh, uh, and of course, I would frequently go up there and, and visit, even when there were not special occasions. And, uh, and it was always and, and really treated very, very well. Got very nice lunches with them and chatted, and they were just wonderful people to just to just be around and interact with. Well, of course, Eileen Garrett is is a very famous psychic. She was a uh, Tested at the Rhine Laboratory once. I was not there at the time, uh, and uh, of course there was a uh, there was a biography. I think it was written by Larry Lashana, whether she wrote it herself. But I mean, you know, her, certainly we have unusually good documentation of her early life and you know, how she got involved in 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 mediumship. So I think we had a very good. Biography of uh, of her, and uh, you know, and she was. And I remember she had a very objective view of her own experiences. It wasn't a lot of metaphysical overlay. I mean, she could really, you know, cut through a lot of that, which which I find very annoying in most psychics. And uh, she was, I think, a very notable exception to that. Just the uh, you know, willing to, to look objectively 
at what was happening to her and her struggles and trying to understand it. I think really set her apart from uh, most of most other mediums. They had a huge, uh, you know, a, a, a huge library, and it was, uh, of course, a, a a resource for uh, a lot of people. Of course, when I was in Virginia, they had a good library down there too, so I didn't make that much use of it at the time, but. Certainly, it was very impressive. You just go in and see all the rows and rows of books on the uh, on the table. I was certainly one of the, uh, you know, one of the re real resources that they have for people in the New York area who wanted to uh, uh, do research. In, in, in it was just as great as a research library. It was kind of set up that way, and uh, it was a very valuable resource. Yeah, well, I mean, it, I say I, I didn't have a whole lot of uh, uh, knowledge about the inner workings, but it certainly didn't surprise me that Lizette would take over. I mean, I certainly had the impression that when I was with there that she was, you know, she was obviously involved in the decisions, and you could sort of get the sense she was being groomed for that. And, uh, you know, it's a family organization. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And particularly, I mean, the you know, founder is someone of the stature of, uh, of Eileen Garrett, I mean, just to maintain the identity. I mean, we have a very similar thing here with, uh, you know, Sally Feather taking over a lot of the uh, responsibilities of the, of, of the Rhines that are not quite to that extent as it was at the, uh, at the PF. But again, I mean, uh, we have some of the situation down here that we're, we're I think, to a large extent a uh, family kind of organization. I mean, Sally certainly has a lot of influence in, uh, in, in what's going on with the Rhine now. There's nothing wrong with that Rhine any more than there is at, uh, at the PF. Well, as an editor, I can certainly appreciate, uh, you know, the importance of, uh, you know, good outlets for our research and, and scholarship, and also the amount of work that that goes into it, so I certainly highly value the uh, the two uh, journals that the Parapsychology Foundation put out, the International Journal uh, of Parapsychology, which was replaced by Parapsychology Review. It's sort of a cross between a journal and a magazine, but there were some you know very, very important papers published in there. In fact, I think one of the, my most important papers that I've ever published was the latest in a series of papers I wrote on reconceptualizing the Psy controversy. And I think the last, uh, the last and most important of that series of papers was published in Parapsychology Review. And uh, some of the seeds for that was uh, when a paper I presented at one of their, at one of their uh, conferences. So your OBE theory paper first appeared there also. Did oh, that's right, yes. my. Uh, I can remember that was another another paper that uh, that I published in in Parapsychology Review uh, was a theory developed of out of the body experiences, which uh, I think that that one has gotten cited. Uh, I think quite a bit. I think it was one of uh, three major psychological theories of the out of body experience, and it was not talking about externalization. But the view of, of really how it be explained through through conventional psychology can be combined with the uh, combined with ESP, and uh, and the three theories actually had something in common with each other. I think one paper I wrote actually tied the three together. I, I think that was in a, some other paper I wrote, and the other ones were by Harvey Irwin and Susan Blackmore. So it was kind of a troika. <laughs> Early in my career, the uh, the Parapsychology Foundation helped greatly by giving me research grants. Uh, and I guess the most important of which was for the uh, for the Virginia Survey, which uh, I, could, I would not have been able to do without their support. And then, of course, later, in a way, I think probably the most important thing that they contributed to was to the program at John F. Kennedy University, even though that wasn't a research grant per se. It's more of an education. I think that was. Uh, you know, a very important development in the field, as I said, a number of uh, a number of my students have gone on and make contributions in parapsychology. So, so on, on both those fronts, with their help, has been immensely valuable to me and to the field. Uh, 
uh, I think what's going to be remembered most, probably their conferences, actually, I think would probably be remembered most. I think if people bother to, uh, you know, they do publish the proceedings, I think if people would bother in reading them, they probably aren't cited as much as they should be. But I've always thought, you know, that I always feel that I'm personally writing for posterity. I don't feel, I, I don't feel, I don't expect people to take me very seriously until after I die, and I'm hoping maybe people will, you know, 20 or 30 years after I'm in my grave, people will say how insightful I was, so I, I, sometimes I'll ego trip about that. And uh, it may be the same with the PF, I may, I may be, uh, I think it's comes in particular, the kind of things that I think may end up because they really did deal with some very fundamental issues in some very sophisticated ways, but in ways because the nature of the publication is not going to get a lot of play at the time. It's something that I can see uh, 20, 30 years from now, uh, people in parapsychology going back and finding them to be very, very valuable resources. Uh, but I think everything they did, certainly, you know, I think the, the research they funded, I think, has lasting values. I'm not one of these people who believe that research comes obsolete 20 years after it's published. I think that's nonsense. And uh, so I think that, you know, the, the studies they funded, like the Virginia survey, are certainly part of their legacy. And, uh, but, you know, I think, that, I think that really remains to be seen. I don't think we can give a good answer to that at this time. I guess if I had to try to sum it up briefly, I'm not quite sure I can quite do this in two sentences, but, uh, <clears throat> you know, I think it goes back to their founder, Eileen Garrett, what she stood for, and I think the foundation was really to fulfill her legacy, in a sense, because she had a very research academic attitude about her own experiences and her ways to understand them. And I think what the Parapsychology Foundation was to do was basically to help her achieve that objective through the research of uh, people that were active after she went away.